Good afternoon and welcome to the Queer Rural Connections Project. My name is Tim Alsop and I'm an actor, writer, director who's been working with Dr. Kira Allman to bring Queer Rural Connections to you today. Uh, we are supported by Torch as part of the uh, Humanities Cultural Programme and this afternoon we've got some wonderful talks from a number of speakers and some extracts from the play and film which has been uh, touring. We've started in Reading at the Merle and next week we're off to the Museum of East Anglian Life. Um, so this afternoon's programme, we're going to be hearing some extracts from the play. Uh, we're going to start in a moment with a little extract from the film that we made earlier this year. Uh, and then between sort of extracts being shown, we're going to have a number of talks by some academics uh, who are leading in their field on LGBTQ work. Um, and so before we go into the film, I'm just going to introduce the sort of programme. So after we've seen the extract, I'll begin with a talk about how the project came about. Uh, and some of the sort of work we've been doing, the methodologies. We'll then hear from the actors, who are William Wynne Davies and Tigger Blaze. And then we'll hear from Dr Catherine Lee, Deputy Dean at Anglia Rus uh, Education at Anglia Ruskin University, who's written extensively on LGBTQ plus inclusion and education. Uh, she's also one of the founders of the Courageous Leaders, uh, an LGBTQ plus leadership program for training teachers. We'll hear some more extracts from the play, and then we will hear from Dr. Dimitri Papanikolas, um, Associate Professor in Modern Greek at the University of Oxford, uh, and a Fellow of St. Cross College, who's written on queer theory and the history of Greek uh, queer cultures. So that's Papanikolas. And then uh, we will hear, lastly hear from Dr. Kira Orman from the Center of Social Legal Studies and my co-project leader on this whole project. Uh, who's been doing research into broadband access and community networks in rural locations. So let's get started. Uh, you're about to see a small extract from the film we made earlier this year, which uh, we mainly filmed in East Anglia, largely due to COVID restrictions, um, although some of the stories we've uh, found for the play have come from across the country. And the plan is to sort of extend this project. So we're going to go over to the film extract now. For a long time, I felt the only way to be queer was to move to the city. In the books I read, in the TV I watched in the films, gay life always seemed to be portrayed in an urban environment. And growing up here in Suffolk in the 1980s and 90s, there weren't any gay role models. I mean, we didn't really even talk about it because of things like Section 28. So in 2000, I did move to the city and I lived there for nearly 20 years. But in 2019, I moved back out to a rural space. I began to see that actually there is a rich and diverse queer rural life that's, that's always been here. Having spaces and um, being around people that look like you, um, it, it really does shape you. I struggled for a long time with my multiple identities because there weren't people that shared similar experiences to me that looked like me. Being dual heritage, kind of the cultural expectations I have from Ethiopia and then being British and then, oh, add queer into the mix. It's like, how do I like <laughs> figure all of that you know, out? And then it's like, how do I, okay, I can be queer in British, that seems cool. But then people at home are telling me this is a Western invention, you know, like you can't. <laughs> so I'm like, how do I be Ethiopian and queer? I'd gone to Pride in London, but, you know, it really centred white gay men. I was like, this is really not my vibe. <laughs> the next day, which is after the main London Pride, is UK Black Pride. So I went along with my friends and we were like, this is amazing. It was just so rich and diverse and yeah I just really felt at home there. It would be nice to have that kind of queer community as I do in, in London here but then I'm also having kind of you know the, the life that I want being out in the country and being around family people I care about and finding inspiration for my creativity as well. So you gotta go in. It's gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> it's not as cold as I thought it, it, it would not? be. No. I'm tempted now. It's nicer. <laughs> it's kind of a place where, you know, no other 
constraints are there. There's no other boxes or um, things that you have to consider. It's just you and the open sea and, you know, you can be anything you want to be really. It's, it's lovely. So you've just seen there an extract from the film and we'll be doing a full premiere through Torch on the 26th of July and we're covering lots of different lives uh, in that story and uh, it's, a, yeah, it's a really lovely watch. So where did all of this project come from? So I'm now going to sort of read, uh, read through a paper and sort of give you an explanation of how this project all came about. So I was in Lower Stoff Ness, standing on a piece of municipal art that looked like a cross between a toxic hazard sign and a compass. It marked the easternmost point of England, as far as you could go without falling into the sea. But even though I knew exactly where I was, I felt completely lost. Over the years, I had visited the seaside town countless times, it being little more than a half hour's drive from where I grew up in Suffolk. My dad had recently bought a static caravan a mile down the coast, and I was visiting during a summer breakdown between two national lockdowns. The caravan was in a trailer park overlooking the North Sea perched on a sandy bluff that was eroding each year by feet rather than inches. Proudly, Dad showed me around, pointing out the clever pull-out sofa bed, surprisingly ample bathroom and a snug guest room with beds that were barely large enough to fit a four-year-old. While I took pleasure in his joy at having a place to holiday after years of putting his own needs second to almost everyone else, I could not help but be aware of how isolated the place made me feel. There was something a little unnerving, a little Stepford Wives about how similar all the caravans looked. Lined up in rows with two oblong windows on either side, they looked like decapitated heads of giants. The uneasy feeling continued as Dad and I made our way along the beach into Lowestoft. The coastal town had been in decline for years, and the fallout from COVID-19 was doing nothing to help that fact. We stopped at one of the takeaways on the seafront, and I treated Dad to a bag of chips. Above the shop door hung a three-foot smiling plastic catfish with cartoon barbells those bits that looked like a moustache. And it reminded me of Walker from Dad's Army. In fact, the whole town felt like a time slip into a bygone world. As we walked along, Dad reeled off all the shops that were closing for good, while I looked at the worn out buildings battered by years of winter storms. Looking back out towards three oil tankers anchored offshore, I began to think about troubling me, but it was difficult to get at the feeling. I peered over at Dad, searching for an answer, but he looked entirely serene. He was exactly where he was meant to be, or oh, that's what it felt like to me. Whereas I, self, I, whereas I found myself thinking back to my seaside visits as a child and the precarity that had shaped so much of my early life. Was this why I was feeling so anxious? Both my parents were from poor backgrounds. Dad worked in a meat factory and my mother was a pensions clerk. Over the years, the factory work became increasingly low paid because of cutbacks in overtime and wa wage stagnation. When I was seven, mum was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and soon uh, was forced to give up work. Dad, too, eventually had to stop work because of a bad hip and caring for her full time. For three years, while I was a teenager, we were essentially at the mercy of the state, which was thankfully more compassionate than it has been of late. There were periods when our situation was precarious and consequently I learned from an early age what it meant to be part of the just managing. Eleven years later, Despite our financial and day-to-day -day struggles with mum, I was fortunate enough to secure a place at university, the first one in my family to go. I write that with no hint of smugness, but because it marked the moment I was able to leave and redefine myself. Dad was overjoyed because he saw the opportunities a university education offered me, and he wasn't wrong. It began a journey that would lead, uh, lead from the middle of nowhere Suffolk to training as an actor, coming out as gay, moving to London, and finally reaching a point where my life became recognisably that of the urban, aspirational middle class. But then along came COVID-19. Within a matter of days, as half the world went into lockdown, almost all my work dried up. My income dropped by nearly 80% and looked unlikely to recover for months. I was thrown back to a time when I had constantly worried about the future and money. It did not matter that I had an education, or that I managed to get a foot in the door of the theatre industry, or that I lived a particular lifestyle, the urban middle-class life I had, felt, uh, I had built felt brittle. But then it always had. I had never quite shaken the anxiety. If anything, it had become worse. As I walked up and down the seafront, passing the haunts of my childhood, the pier where I used to hang out with summer friends, and the kiosk where I used to buy bags of five molten hot doughnuts for a pound, 
I realised the fears that were not simply rooted in those early experiences of struggle. Yes, there was a forlorn air that hung around much of Lowestoft, but it was also a place of fun that evoked as many happy memories as it did unhappy ones. There was something else at work, a feeling that, although I knew this place well, it was somewhere I felt I could not belong, a place that did not feel like it was made for a gay person like me. While COVID-19 had, uh, had brought my personal crisis to a head, the feeling that I was an outsider had never really left. In autumn 2019, my partner and I decided to leave London, a city in which 2.7% of people identify as LGB. My partner was about to become a student and I was a freelancer on a small income, so staying in London made little sense financially. The response from our friends was mixed and could be roughly divided into two camps. Those who understood the financial and practical reasons and those who said things like, you'll miss London gay life, or okay, we'll see you when you next come into town. On a Friday and Saturday night, I was used to going to places like The Glory, Heaven and G.A.Y. I spent my money on dining in restaurants, going to the theatre, even if it meant regularly getting into debt. I liked being able to see a group of friends at short notice and host dinner parties and have drinks nights. There seemed extra pressure as someone who identified as being gay, that living my best gay life meant being in London, and even specific parts of London. Sometimes it felt as though there was an almost cultish dismissal of men, among many of my friends, straight and queer, of the rural or non-metropolitan space, especially when it came to issues of the rural poor or to thorny subjects such as Brexit. More than once at a dinner party, I'd heard a version of the phrase, those ignorant poor people voting for Brexit, they'll be the ones who suffer for it. And it would make me wince because I knew, that some of the, I knew some of those people. They were a part of me, a part of my blood, I tried not to think about the social cost of leaving London, but it felt as though I was being cut loose by a large section of our queer and urban-centric friends. And to an extent, I understood their reaction. I too could not help but think of it as a backward step, as though I was admitting, admitting defeat against a city and a way of life that I had been taught to strive for for years. The sense of failure was tangible. I was moving to a provincial space and away from any semblance of gay life, or so I thought. Both Didier Erebon and Edouard Louis eloquently expressed the cost of escaping a working class upbringing in gay men in France. And my experience shares many parallels with theirs. Erebon discusses the painful experience of trying to reconnect with his rural family and returning to Reims, a family he wanted little to do with. Yet I cannot express the same contempt towards my working class family or my rural roots as either Louis or Erebon, especially as I had not been rejected by them. In truth, I often felt a longing for aspects of that rural life that now seemed lost. My connection with the land and the rhythm of the seasons, the unpretentiousness and candor of family and friends, the community, the history, and those early informative experiences which create indelible emotional resonances with a place. When I start to think about where my feelings of unease and discomfort come from, I instead turn to my gay urban experience and its emphasis on status, wealth, and consumerism. <laughs> of course, I know that urban and rural spaces do not have fixed value systems, and I also acknowledge that class is a slippery term. Even so, I do know what the feeling of not belonging is like, and of rarely feeling good enough, and I've come to associate those feelings of inadequacy with aspirational living, and the ways in which I was being asked consciously and unconsciously to repress or disregard my rural working class background. But even more than that, in writing this film uh, and working to make this play, I wanted to explore how being gay and the identity of uh, the gay and wider queer community has been aggressively defined by urban middle class expressions of being in the world, and that we have largely ignored and neglected queer rural experiences, especially those of the working class. Queer people have been taught to escape to the city largely because that's where we see vibrant queer life happening, where we see queer clubs, bars and services, it's where we see a lot of our queer history. It's also where we perceive our success. Rural queers like me are encouraged to feel lucky, and it is mostly luck, to get to the big city. And once there, we ascribe to moneyed careers, Tom Daly-esque bodies, reading The Guardian, hosting endless social engagements at which we must be infinitely witty, and to make sure that all of this is catalogued on our, on our social media feeds to prove that we are living out our best gay lives. At the same time, we learn to distance ourselves from the rural people who we wrongly judge as living in a backward or boring countryside, or we sneer and use the loaded term provincial. We carelessly dismiss the countryside as a place of lack against the city's never-ending possibilities. 
We try to perform as best we can, cleaving our pasts and our provincialism and instead yearn for an urbanized perfectionism. These stresses have been highlighted in a five-year study carried out by to John Panyakas and his team at Yale, which highlighted in a five-year study um, uh, which, uh, sorry, highlighted in a five-year study that show the pressures of gay men suffering within their gay communities and networks, especially around issues of perceived social and sexual status. Some of these pressures, which I have experienced, seem particularly acute to gay men and are undoubtedly influenced by toxic masculinity. They are also influenced by the trauma and shame we have felt growing up in a heterosexual world, famously discussed in The Velvet Rage. But Panyaka's study also seems to suggest the problems are more potent in larger urban areas than in their rural locales. This suggests that we should be careful of associating all our negative behavior with internalized shame, and that perhaps the culture of city life can be as toxic as the persecution we experienced when we were younger. Yet for all the problems of the city, the countryside did not seem like a place in which I could either live or work. As a gay man growing up in the 80s and 90s, the countryside was a place you came from rather than one in which you stayed. Whenever I saw queer people in rural settings on TV and film, it was usually in the context of middle-class merchant ivory films, where two well-educated boys would escape for a short period from their boarding school to roll around in the long grass while reading poetry to one another, before growing up, marrying a woman, going to the city to work, or going off to the colonies. These kinds of class-bound stories seem to persist and often come at the expense of working class and particularly rural stories. On the subject of James Ivory, even today, we do not just gape at the growing tension between Timothy Chalamet and Army Hammer in Call Me By Your Name, but at the insanely beautiful Italian house and garden with its terrace, staff, and attics, attic rooms full of abused fruit. Gay intimacy is given meaning and validity between beautiful, educated, well-to-do gay men falling in love with another in a beautiful space. And while there's much to admire in Call Me By Your Name, we should also recognize as gay, queer, and straight viewers, we are unconsciously being encouraged to see intimacy at its fullest in aesthetically middle-class environs. There are excellent examples of working-class intimacy that have received some mainstream attention, such as God's Own Country and Moonlight, where we observe gay characters learning to express intimacy and vulnerability in tough living circumstances. But the box office takings in the UK market were just over a million dollars for God's Own Country, compared to Call Me By Your Name, which took nearly 2.4 million. Of course, distribution of the latter was much wider, received Oscar nominations, and was adapted by a firmly established gay writer from an already successful novel. But it still raises a question of what class of gay we are being asked to invest in emotionally. Growing up, I had some exposure to queer stories that engaged with working class characters, such as Queer as Folk and My Beautiful Laundrette. Although even there, there's a distinct lack of rural experiences. Even recently in It's a Sin, the characters escape from places like the Isle of Wight to London. On the rare occasions we see mainstream stories of working class queer people from rural areas, narratives often center on the protagonist having escaped a traumatic or homophobic experience, with examples such as Gypsy Boy being typ typical of a kind of queer poverty porn. Otherwise, we meet characters who are so eccentric that they only increase our suspicion and derision of the provincial poor. Joe Exotic from Tiger King being the most obvious example. And when it comes to working class gay sex, it is frequently characterized as trade for the middle class sexual tourist. Scally porn plays on the middle class desire to be assaulted or sexually dominated by people characterized as chavs. Even in drag, there's been, where there's been a traditionally strong and diverse visibility of working class queer people, including trailblazers such as Lily Savage, there are sometimes snide remarks about those drag queens who are termed as dressing in ratchet drag. Of course, RuPaul should be appreciated for having do done more than most to bring drag into the mainstream. But the emphasis on prize money uh, and the attack on drag queens such as Joe Black for daring to wear H&M and looking too regional only helps to maintain the idea that queers from the provinces are the poor country cousin. Returning to the caravan after our walk, Dad greeted another couple who also lived on the caravan site. They gave me a knowing glance. When we were inside and waiting for the tea to boil, my dad explained that they had talked with the, uh, the couple on a few occasions. At first, they had been sheepish and guarded in the conversation. But when dad had mentioned in passing that I was gay, they suddenly opened up and revealed that they too had a gay son who still lived in the area. Dad said that they, he thought that they were probably worried about being judged. And this reticence made me think about how much was not being said 
The persistent invisibility of rural queer people continues because families feel nervous to talk about it openly. It also made me think about those queer people who have never left the place in which they grew up. In many ways, my leaving the city, which had been possible because of my education, had precipitated my coming out. And so when I left the city years later, I was able to do it largely on my own terms. Later that night, I reached out to a school friend who had come out as gay and had spent his whole life in Suffolk. We spoke about the challenges he'd overcome, especially around coming out and finding other local gay people. And through him and others, I began to meet and talk with other rural queer people. Before long, I was speaking to hundreds of people all over the UK. Ali and Lorraine told me about setting up Ipswich's first uh, gay night, Betty's. I heard about the importance of out-of-the-way queer pubs like the Horse and Hounds, which drew people from the next county. I listened to how Jay worked with local farmers and queer people to build a house in North Wales, and what it was like for June growing up as a queer Asian in a small village. Through a number of innovative archival projects, I also learned about queer rural historical characters. The vicar in the 1960s who went through a sex change and was entirely accepted in the village and the local press. The rural lesbian archaeologist who changed the way we think about Neolithic man, the wartime lovers and many, many more. Without a doubt, there exists a rich, diverse and often joyful queer life in the countryside and it's these experiences are at the heart of why I chose to make this play and film. So from that, the queer oral connections grew into a large scale oral testimony project. The process has been a complex and at times difficult one, and one where, which we were, both of us, I think from the outset, mindful that we wanted to be a participatory approach, where all of the people we were interviewing were engaged with all parts of that process, the interviewing, the making of the work, and how the work was disseminated. We found that by involving participants from that, all stages, that we've been able to sort of develop a, a set of ethics and values that in which everyone feels sort of they've had a conversation about that. And I think in many ways it's also opened up the creative process that's truly felt uh, like an ensemble approach. For me, uh, as, a, as a white gay man, I also knew I didn't want to center that story in the film or the play. And so I think a lot of the lives that we've been able to explore, especially in the film, are from communities that we really don't get to hear much about, certainly in a rural environment. And we've learned so much already, and there's so much data still to go through from oral testimonies. Um, and yes, we've, ha we've had several outputs, the play, the film, there will be a sound archive as well, but we'll continue to develop uh, these testimonies into other projects. And I think that's part of what's interesting about it as well, that there are different ways to engage with the project throughout. But we've been able to cover diverse issues, such as the decline in queer rural spaces, uh, how the internet has changed the situation for rural people, access to services, as well as, um, as well as thinking about more kind of intimate and emotional expressions like coming out. And I think a lot of these issues, if you're talking about access to services, it's not just about the queer community. Rural culture has often been associated with conservatism, traditional gendered roles and conformity. But by paying attention to queer experiences, there's an opportunity for us all to reconsider our assumptions and attitudes towards the countryside. The stories in the play and film are about who lays claim to rural Britain. How we think not only about rural queer people, but about the rural poor and rural communities that have been disregarded because of our obsession with the city. That deadly phrase, we're all middle class now, spoken by John Prescott in 1997, signalled a process of urbanisation and gentrification that had been long underway. But it also marked the erosion of older working class expressions of power. Many of the queer people I've spoken to would describe themselves as having come from modest backgrounds where they had very little money. They did not always have an option to move away. In Hillbilly Elegy, J.D. Vance tried to suggest that the white working class of the Rust Belt and the Appalachian rural communities needed to work harder to better themselves. But he made the mistake of thinking his personal experience was something that could be applied to everyone, largely ignoring the systemic ways in which a region and group had been neglected educationally, economically and by a lack of local services for years. The countryside is often portrayed as a place of less against the city's promise of more. And while this can be particularly true, uh, and while this can be particularly true for queer people, in terms of access to queer spaces and services, the fact is that these aren't only queer issues. They're about the way rural communities have been neglected. It is the difference between the countryside I saw mytho mythologized in those Merchant Ivory films and the reality of what I could see around me in Lowestoft. 
We are happy to slap Downton Abbey on a tin of National Trust biscuits and sell them for 10 quid. But are we re really willing to invest in proper transport links, new jobs, local libraries, rural broadband and education and pubs, queer or otherwise, that might offer more opportunities for those of us living and working in rural areas? So, I cannot hope to give a complete picture of rural gay and queer life in this film and play, but make no mistake, there has always been a queer presence in the countryside. Around 1.2% of people in the east of England, where I grew up, openly identify as LGB. That's approximately 50,000 people. I suspect there are also many more of us who still feel unable to come out, as well as many others, like me, who still possess a strong relationship with those rural locales of our childhood. Many of my city queer friends have quietly said that they often miss their small town or rural homes, but felt like they had no choice but to go to the city. The recent pandemic has created space for renewed conversations around ruralness, communal effort and solidarity once more. We are a minority and we are always likely to remain so, but we're also everywhere. Thank you. We're now going to... Um, hear a small extract uh, from the start of the play uh, and these two characters Dan and Ali so Ali uh, set up Betty's which was a nightclub in Ipswich and there were a few ad hoc gay nights before that but Betty's grew into a huge sort of gay place to meet between I think it was 2002 2003 and 2013 thank you Betty's is tucked away see round the back of the hotel you have to walk down behind the town hall, down this Dickensian alleyway, and then you go through the gate where the hotel car park is. Like a lot of the gay places, we get the venues and the part of town that no one else wants or can make money from. That's why it started on a club night on Sundays. But, you know, we always do seem to make a go of it. And there wasn't really much here for gay people before. There was a pub round the corner back in the 80s and 90s, but really, it's Ali you need to talk to. She's the one who got this whole thing going. Here, Ali, how'd you get the idea for Betty's? So, where to start? Well, the idea for Betty's came about while me and some mates were driving down to the Horse and Hound. Gay pub in the middle of nowhere. Man in tree way. And a group of us would squeeze into this car and drive down the A14. We take it in turns driving from week to week because one of us would have to not drink. Here, Ali, you've missed the bloody turn. You're supposed to be keeping your eye on the roads. Where's the map? Behind the seat. Bloody hell, we're going to have to turn round. Oh, we can just take the next turn off and come back round. It was easier in the summertime because here in Suffolk, the sun don't set till like half nine, nearly ten. But winter times, it was a right old bugger on some of those country roads. Didn't have sat-nav in those days. We're not far now. You're basically on this country road, on the edge of a village, with fields on either side. And if it was a Saturday night, well, you'd see cars parked all down the road. Dozens of them. People would come from miles around. And if someone couldn't drive, there was usually someone who could help out. And it was just a lovely place to meet. Sometimes they'd have a comedian there, stand up, and then they might have live music or put a DJ on. And it was just a nice place to go and have a laugh and be yourself. Like you could meet people, you know, if you were looking for sex. But what I liked about spaces like that is that actually it's about being with people and socialising. It's a place where you don't feel like you're in the minority for a while. But I was thinking, it's ridiculous that we have to drive for like nearly an hour to get to a place and that Ipswich needed its own club night. Oh, don't get me wrong, there had been several pubs over the years, some that were gay or owned by gay people or were just gay friendly, but there wasn't like a regular club night. And that's how the idea for Betty's came along. Come on, let me show you around. So I'm now going to invite Dr. Catherine Lee to come and talk. Um, Dr. Catherine Lee, as I said, is Deputy Dean of Education at Anglia Ruskin University. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Um, I, my presentation today is um, about um, rural school communities and research that I've done in this area. 
Um, I have to say I have spent the last 25 years in, um, in rural Suffolk, so resonated with such a lot of uh, what you've mentioned, Tim, and uh, have spent many a night in, uh, in Betty's and, uh, and so could probably tell the stories of Betty's in, uh, in a far more engaging presentation than, uh, than this is going to be. Like, you move me on. Thanks. So... Um, I was, um, I was born in the 60s um, in rural South Yorkshire um, in a little village outside um, a mining town um, near Rotherham. Um, I wanted to be a boy, desperately wanted to be a boy. Specifically, I wanted to be Kevin Keegan um, and wore my football kit at absolutely every opportunity. Um, I, at 18, went to Liverpool to do my teacher training and had 10 years having the time of my life um, in it, my first experience of, of urban life um, in, in Liverpool and predominantly in um, Manchester and the, uh, the, the very beginnings of Canal Street before Canal Street was anywhere near it is uh, now. And then I, um, I met my partner 25 years ago and um, moved to uh, rural Suffolk. And it's from moving to rural Suffolk and, and the kind of um, the shock, quite honestly, the cultural shock between my life in Liverpool and suddenly being in absolutely the, the back of beyond that uh, gave me a real interest in, in what it meant to be um, living in a rural community and specifically to be working in education. So, as I've said, I've been a teacher in Liverpool and in rural Suffolk, and I left teaching in 2010 after some homophobia in my rural school community in Suffolk, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about. I'm now Deputy Dean at, Ed, at Anglia Ruskin University. Um, that's, for those of you that don't know, it is the other university in Cambridge. Um, we're also based in, uh, in Chelmsford and Peterborough too. And my research looks at the experiences of LGBT teachers. I've also been fortunate enough to, um, to, to get involved with and, and lead uh, the first LGBT leadership program, which is called Courageous Leaders, and more about that a little bit later on. Thank you. So, um, many of you will be familiar with Section 28 of the Local Government Act. Um, I, as a badge of honor, was a teacher for every single living minute of Section 28 from 1988 all the way through to 2003. And for those people not familiar with Section 28, it said, among many other things, that a local authority shall not intentionally promote homosexuality or publish material with the intention of promoting homosexuality. Um, and that was important because at the time, all schools, um, apart from private schools, all schools were um, under the leadership of the local authority. So um, it, the Section 28 applied to schools um, that sat within local authorities, which, was, as I say, was all of them. Um, but it also said that um, anybody working in a school could not promote the teaching of the acceptability of homosexuality as a pretended family relationship. So, basically, all of us teaching during that time felt that if, we, if anybody found out that we were gay, um, we, if anybody found out that we were talking about being gay um, as, as okay, as a pretended family relationship, then we would lose our jobs. And although, you know, nobody... Nobody was prosecuted under Section 28. Um, lots of people were mysteriously moved on in schools during that time. So it was confusing, it was frightening, um, and most importantly, it was absolutely impossible to take your authentic self as a teacher to work or to provide any source of pastoral support for young people who were, um, you know, got questions and, and were, were thinking about their, their, own, um, their own sexual and gender identity. 
It really was state-sponsored silence. That's how it felt. Thank you. Um, but everything changed for me well after Section 28 was repealed. And it changed for me um, as recently as 2010. And this is lifted from um, the Suffolk Police Crime Report of the 30th of March 2010. And um, it involved problems that um, my partner and I had with a neighbour in, in our rural cottage. Um, you'll, see, you'll see there that we had, there were many incidents of this neighbour coming onto our land and urinating, staring through the windows at night. But the thing that was had the biggest impact on me was something I had feared would happen throughout my teaching career. And that was that this neighbour, who happened to have five children at the, the school where I was the assistant head teacher, went into school, made an appointment with the head teacher to say that did he know about my living arrangements. Um, and he qualified his concern by saying that I'd been staring lustfully at his daughters aged 11. He had, he had sons at the school as well. I wasn't accused of staring lustfully at those. So the house that we absolutely loved um, and had nearly paid for, we put on the market and sold. I should say there was only um, the property that the neighbour lived in and our property um, and nothing else for half a mile in either direction. So the shouting could take place and nobody else, nobody else was there to, to hear it. And we didn't, we knew that we could go to the police, but we felt absolutely far too vulnerable to do so um, before we were ready to leave. So we put our house on the market and um, we found a rental accommodation um, in Essex and we, we reported him to the police the day before we were moving and um, we moved on the 1st of April um, into Essex with help from, um, from Suffolk County Council and the hate crime um, department there who helped us to move away from this neighbour. Thank you. So as, as I've said, um, pretty much um, pick up the story as we reported the, the neighbour to the police and we moved away from Suffolk, didn't tell anybody where we were going. I left teaching and we started our lives again. Thank you. And um, uh, when the head teacher had, um, he had been, been spoken to by the, the neighbour, um, he said, you need, to, you need to get out of the house you're selling as quickly as possible. This, this guy has a real problem with you. And I said, well, I hope that <laughs> I will report him to the police. And, I, you know, I hope when I leave that, that you will, you, you know, you will talk to the police if I send them in your direction um, and tell, tell them um, what, what I'm going through. And the head teacher said that he wanted absolutely no involvement. He said... It's important to me, um, parent power is everything, that I, I keep the parents on side as this guy sends his, you know, multiple children through our school. Um, when we reported the incident to Suffolk Police, um, I decided um, to... Well, they, they basically, nothing happened. It went completely and utterly silent. And I had an email one day from Suffolk Police to say that they t the police had, re had taken the file to the Crown Prosecution Service and the Crown Prosecution Service had advised no further action and said the Crown Prosecution Service had deemed that I had misunderstood the actions of the neighbour as the rough and tumble of family life. Um, I later 
try to find out a little bit more about this this idea of the rough and tumble of family life and how somebody urinating in your garden and going to your workplace and outing you could possibly be the rough and tumble of family life. When I asked Suffolk police for um, the information pertaining to my um, my my file, um, I was initially sent the information that I've um, I've sh shared with you there. But when I pursued it further, they said that they had lost there was two copies of the file. One was at Bury St Edmunds, the other was in Lowestoft, and both copies um, had been lost. The Crown Prosecution Service have no record of the incident ever being reported, either locally or nationally. Next slide, please. So this is saying, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. And um, when I left teaching, um, I wanted to learn a little bit more. You know, there, there has been lots written about the experience of LGBT teachers in the urban context, but there is next to nothing written about LGBT teachers in, in rural school communities. And I wanted to write about that. So I went off to the Institute of Education in London and I went to do a PhD, intending to interview other teachers in rural schools. I had a terrible time finding them and, um, and was really getting nowhere fast with my, um, my research. And one day um, with my supervisor, I started to tell him the story, this, you know, why I was interested in this particular, um, in this, in this particular sort of um, academic field. And he said, why don't you write a short vignette about it? Why don't you write about what happened to you? Um, and that could be, a little piece of one of the chapters of your PhD thesis. 80,000 words later, <laughs> I was still writing about the incident. And so, um, and I found autoethnography. So for those of you that, that are not aware, auto as in autobiography is about the self. And it is, um, it's research that is centered around your own, um, your own experiences. So I, I pulled together lots of sources of, um, evidence from the time, hence my looking for the, the police report, text messages between my partner and myself, um, email contact I'd had with the head teacher, and I put it all together. Um, and I've been fortunate enough that my PhD was um, published as a monograph, um, and there it is. It's such a, it was published in 2017, it's such a personal story. I've, I, my name is Catherine Lee. I've used my partner's name and hyphenated it together because there was still this sense of putting so much of myself out there and, and what that meant and whether it was going to affect my, my career in future. So what did I learn? What's my thesis about? What, what was my PhD about? And, and I think that's, that's the apt summary for me. My, my rural school community was a heteronormative. It was a homophobic space. And the status quo was protected at all costs by those people with a dominant sense of belonging in that rural community. And in the case of, uh, of this incident, it was the neighbour. Um, he was a wholesome family man with lots of children um, and horses. Um, it was the head teacher who was the pillar of the rural school community and wanted to get on with all the, um, all the teachers. And it was the rural police force the the bobbies on the beat and I even though I'd I'd lived in Suffolk for quite some time um it you know I did not have a sense of uh, a dominant sense of belonging and that's you talked about that that feeling on ease in, in lower stuff absolutely that I really really resonated with that Tim so the themes, the themes from my, my, own, um, my own research, the intersection of my, my teacher identity and my sexual identity, um, they, and the incompatibility of my teacher self and my, and my personal self. Um, I learned about the social construction of rurality, and I love, I love this phrase, the absence of the gaze, because when you say it without it being written down, <laughs> yeah, rurality is the absence of the gaze, the G-A-Y-S gaze. Um, and I know, you know one of the, one of the um, articles I read when I was doing my own research was by Neil and Walters in 2007, and uh, the, title of, the, the title of their um, 
article was, um, you can get away with loads because there's no one here. And that was absolutely my experience. This, there was, there, had there been another house, there would have been somebody else to say, don't shout that, don't do that, that's not right. But there was nobody else um, to, to, to regulate the behavior. Privacy and surveillance was a big deal. I needed, you know, the, my private life was really, really important to me. Yet when, as a teacher, somebody makes an allegation that you're staring at children, you, and, and we, we are taught as trainee teachers that be, you know, be visible, be, um, you know, be seen at all times. It's really, really important. So that relationship between privacy and surveillance when I wanted privacy, when I wanted to be surveyed, um, came through. The role of the home um, in LGBT relationships. My home with my partner was the only place in which I felt, perhaps apart from Betty's, where I, I could live out that relationship authentically. And when, when that home didn't feel safe anymore, it, I didn't even know who we were. And... and it eroded my sense of safety, sense my confidence. Um, the health and well-being of teachers, um, as a consequence of this um, incident, I um, I was given 17 weeks of CBT <laughs> to get over <laughs> the my fear of the neighbour. Um, so it was about fixing me to fix the neighbour. Um, and as, as I don't need to, to expand any further, the relationship between me and, and the rural police force that I hoped would protect me and, and clearly didn't. Thank you. So, um, my second um, making lemons, uh, sorry, making lemonade from lemons um, it rests with this um, project, which I'm massively, massively passionate about. Um, Courageous Leaders is, was funded by the Department for Education in 2016 and I was asked to be involved with schools across the east of England to, um, to set up a leadership programme to help teachers who were LGBTQ um, get um, positions of senior leadership in, in schools. We're almost up to 70 teachers so far that have got the job in senior leadership, either head teacher or the senior role that they have aspired to, um, to, to work towards. And I tell my story um, as part of the Courageous Leaders program. And what struck me really strongly was they'd also got stories. The participants on the program also had a narrative and very positive in some cases, not so positive and quite similar to mine, and in, and in other cases, much worse than mine. And so um, I had an idea that we would collect all these together in a book. Um, so the book that you see there is Courage in the Classroom, and it is all those, um, a number of Courageous Leaders participants share their story and their tips for how schools can be more LGBT inclusive. So um, I can't recommend that, um, uh, uh, recommend the book enough. Thank you. And I've been back more recently to do the piece of research I always planned to do for my PhD, which was to look at the experiences of LGBT teachers in rural schools. And for the project that I did, I, I compared them with um, those working in towns and those working in cities, so their, their urban and suburban counterparts. And they were the sort of three research questions that I, I wanted to investigate. So looking at whether teacher identity and sexual identity was, and gender identity was compatible, um, whether the teachers thought that their LGBT identity had effect, av adversely affected their opportunities for promotion, and whether they'd suffered from anxiety or depression linked to their sexual or gender identity and their role as a teacher. So I'm just going to go through some of the headlines in what I found, if that's okay. Um, I'm not. First of all, I'm going to just talk about the theoretical perspective. So very quickly, um, it rejects essentialist paradigms of sexuality and gender, very much subscribing to, to uh, a, a sort of Butlerian um, approach to, um, to, to, this, to this study. But it does recognize that this idea that schools, schools 
um, create and instill these rigid binaries of male and female, boy, girl, from the earliest years of education all the way through. You know, we start in the play corner and, and it goes all the way through to the school leavers prom. And, you know, when you are a teacher in a school, no matter what the Equality Act says, no matter that Section 28 has been repealed, you're, you are expected to uphold and promote the dominant discourse of the community that you serve. So your, your school is as inclusive as, 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 the, uh, as the community it's based within. Next slide, thanks. So, um, I, I surveyed 105 LGBT uh, teachers and you'll see there, I asked them to what extent they felt that their identity as a teacher and their sexual or gender identity was compatible. And you can see the, um, the village on my left and the city. Um, so the village teachers on my left, the city teachers on my right. Um, almost, you know, more than half of the city teachers felt that their identity, both their identities were totally compatible. And, and only 15% of teachers in rural schools felt that that was the case. Um, the free text comments, um, you know, a lesbian teacher in a rural school said, I was told by the previous head that I was the gossip of the local head teacher's briefing. Um, a teacher, um, a, a lesbian teacher who had her own children um, said that a teacher in the school she was working told her own child that being gay was dirty. And even though, you know, I, throughout this research, I absolutely identified with this idea, it, it, it was much easier um, it, it was easier to be um, an LGBT teacher in, in an urban school. Um, it wasn't ideal. Um, and, and that quote there from a gay, gay male teacher in a city school, I was always terrified of being identified as a sexual predator. Next slide. Um, I asked whether um, the teachers thought their identity had ever been a barrier to, prom um, to promotion as a teacher in schools. And you can see that 41% um, of teachers in villages thought, in, in rural schools, thought that it had, compared with, with less than 20% in city schools. So a massively different perspective. And again, this is research in 2018, 2019. This is not retrospective, this is now. Yeah. Um, and again, um, the, the participants told me um, I was warned by the head teacher not to tell anyone about my sexuality as lesbians don't become head teachers. Um, you know, if ever there was a reason why courageous leaders is needed, that quote captures all of it. Um, and again, the, a gay male teacher told me that the, um, the students in his schools, particularly the, the male students, would there was this whole alpha male sort of challenging him, almost bullying him, um, and that he didn't even apply for promotion because he perceived himself in his own school as being a problem teacher. Um, and again, you know, um, even in a city school, as the teacher said, you know, in terms of, a, a, of her applications to, to get promoted, when she didn't mention the LGBT Pride Club and the work that she did supporting LGBT young people in, in school, she, she realised that her applications went further. She was more likely to be interviewed. She was more likely to get the job. Thank you. And then um, thinking about my, my own, um, you know, the way, the way in which the incident that had happened to me kind of affected my, um, my mental health and sense, sense of self, I asked teachers whether they'd accessed help for anxiety or depression linked to their identity and their role as a teacher. And this was possibly the most stark of the findings. 61% um, of teachers in rural schools had, compared to only 11% of teachers in city schools. Um, again, such a stark difference. And the free text comments, um, say, give, give a clue to that. Um, I have to hide my private life um, and it's exhausting. Um, that idea of 
compartmentalizing that home self and that and that professional self and the way in which that erodes um, that that erodes your your sense of self over time was very much um, apparent. Um, and contrast that with um, teachers in city schools. You know, a teacher there, it's amazing, an opportunity to highlight equality and, um, and you know, tolerance and diversity. Um, and, a, and a teacher at the bottom there feeling that, you know, he, it's, it's important for him to be a strong role model, really important that he, he feels that that is a part of his job. So just to finish, I feel strongly that young people in the countryside deserve access to the full, the full pool of teaching talent. We shouldn't have schools in, in rural locations that are no-go areas for LGBT teachers. Not if we're really serious. We, don't, we want to get away from that, exactly as Tim described, that, that, leaving, that leaving the countryside and going to London, escaping. Um, I believe that, that children, young people in, in rural schools should have access to the diverse role models that the, um, the, the children and young people in, in towns and cities are beginning to enjoy. And we need to talk in rural schools about LGBT teacher identities. And we should be protecting teachers so that they can perform as their authentic self without fear. Um, and as I say there, a rural school community that dominant discourse, that dominant sense of belonging that I didn't have should be one that is far more inclusive and reflects the lives of all of us who live there. We're not all in London and um, it's, things need to improve. So thank you very much. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Catherine. That's Catherine Lee. They're talking about rural education uh, and just, yeah, fascinating, fascinating set of study results from that and, uh, and really moving and to hear your personal story in that journey as well. It's been fascinating, so thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so we are now going to hear from another extract. So we're now inside Betty's, I believe, and we're meeting character Tom, who's its first experience of being inside this space. All right, love. Um, yeah? This your first time here? You from Ipswich? I got the train down from Stone Market. I'm near Backton. Well, this is the bar, and that's Becky over there, and that behind you is the dance floor. What can I get you? I'll have a pint of lager. Is that what you want? I don't really know. <laughs> That's what I have down the pub. Um, actually, can I have a, a rum and coke? All right then. Why don't you take a look around? I remember going in at Betty's that first time. <laughs> I was scared shitless. I'd not told my parents where I was going. You see, I was still living at home then. Just finished my A-levels. I'd known for ages that I'd liked, um, but I wasn't out at school or at home. I mean, this was the early 2000s and kids in school used to use words like puff and faggot. I know things are a lot better now, or getting there, but going into Betty's <laughs> felt scary. There were people of all ages and I just stood on the edge of the dance floor. <laughs> that first time, a couple of people talked to me this one older guy, I thought he was hitting on me. I say older, he was probably about 28. Later that summer, I worked up the courage to take a friend with me, a girl I knew at school, and she and I danced all night. And I even made out with a boy near the speakers. Next day, I could barely hear anything in my right ear, but it was good fun. I just remember how friendly everyone was. It was the first time I felt like I belonged in this place. I copped off with people in the woods and that kind of thing, but it's something else to go to a place and be seen by other people. Thank you. So now we're going to hear from Dr. Dmitri Papanikolaou, who's, uh, as I said at the start, the Associate Professor in Modern Greek at the University of Oxford and a Fellow of St. Cross College. 
Um, written a lot on queer theory and the history of Greek queer cultures, and I know has been also organizing an oral testimony project in Athens as well. Um, so we're going to go over to that talk now. Hello, everyone. And I'm sorry, this is a pre-recorded lecture. I know how much uh, effort Kira and Tim have put into doing this um, into a live event. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm slightly spoiling this, but thanks uh, for being so accommodating. Thank you for this wonderful project. Thanks also to the amazing TORCH team and their Knowledge Exchange program, to Barbara Zweifel, Vicky McGuinness, Wes Williams, who have been amazing in supporting all of us and nourishing, nourishing our projects. I speak advisedly as I also am the recipient of another Knowledge Exchange Fellowship, a lot of what I will say today have been shaped, have been ideas that are being shaped through my knowledge exchange um, project that's called HIV in Greece, a political archive, even though not directly related to that project, of course. My short talk today will be a response to Kira and Tim's project, but it will also draw from my own experience, my own part of the world, and my own experience organizing and researching um, in queer archives in France and Greece. I'll start by sharing a story, a personal story that uh, came to me um, almost as a free association when I started dis discussing uh, with Kira and team and when I got the invitation for today's talk. It's a story of a brave queer individual from Greece who was uh, recently found dead. In the second part of my brief talk, I will share some questions and further thoughts on queer rurality, as well as on archives, on queer archives, on cultural practice, all of that in direct response to the project we are celebrating here today. But let me start, as I said, with the um, story of an individual. I will share my screen and you'll see why. Um, what I will uh, share is in the public domain and very much um, discussed um, recently in Greece. So this is the story of Dimitris or Dimitra from Lesbos, from the island of Lesbos. Dimitris' story has captured the interest of uh, the Greek public repeatedly in recent years, and most recently with the announcement of her tragic death. Forced to identify with her male name, but insisting on a female pronoun, Dimitris was a trans individual who lived all her life in the small village of Sikamnia in the island of Lesbos. Forced also to survive most of her adult life enclosed in the family home and to undergo countless psychiatric assessments and involuntary hospitalizations while receiving heavy medication, which she hated, Dimitra kept asserting her trans identity to anyone who would care to listen, and later in life talked at length to many a bypasser about the beautiful dresses she would order with the help of mail-in catalogues. Even though variously oppressed by her family, she was the one who stayed behind to care for her dying mother and remained in the village alone after the mother's death bravely facing any humiliating behavior by locals and by passers. This is Dimitra. Sorry. One feels the urge to add that this is a story that is not uncommon in today's world, in the various assemblages that we may be referring to as queer ruralities. What is remarkable in Dimitra's story, though, is that she spoke out. She gave an account of herself numerous times in a short documentary from which these stills come 
and which has been shown um, widely. You can find the um, link, the YouTube uh, link. Uh, it's also subtitled here. She also spoke to many journalists who approached her and wrote her story. She also spoke in another video documentary organized by trans activist and artist Paula Revegnotti, who at the moment is uh, the queer archive figure in Greece. As a matter of fact, it was Paula herself, the trans activist who um, also has um, done a, a, a video documentary on Dimitris, who spoke in her own um, public account, a Facebook account uh, of Dimitris's disappearance. Actually, she started posting that she hasn't heard uh, from uh, her for some time. And this gave rise to a public search. The story immediately circulated, garnered the interest even of national politicians and institutions. And it was then, it was eventually that became known that Dimitra had actually once again in recent months been hospitalized without her consent in a psychiatric facility in the island of <clears throat> in the island of Lesbos. She had escaped. And after months of her unofficially missing, it was established only then, only after the national search, that Dimitra had found a tragic death in April 2021, hit by a car and left to die on a pavement, her body lying and claimed in the morgue until the national search resulted in the body's identification by the brother, by her brother. The level of mourning and public feeling on the social media that ensued in the past um, weeks in Greece stood almost as an effort to undo the lack of care that Dimitra had experienced during her lifetime, mainly because of her gender identity. And here you see uh, some photographs uh, from a memorial gathering in Athens in front of Sidagma Square, um, in front of the parliament um, in Dimitra's memory. Uh, happened only on the 24th of June, 2021. Dimitra um, um, was painted this painting also made um, the front page of a national newspaper she was even uh, then made into a playmobil uh, figure you can see here um the, the message that's uh, the symbolic how she's turned into a symbol of peace um and now after her death let the following of this brief talk be another effort to commemorate her, a brave queer individual who lived in a rural context and who showed in her few public appearances that she knew how to laugh at adversity and to atone even the fiercest of her torturers. Now, I have started my presentation not in order to share a brief example that somehow stands as an inverted image of most of the examples featured in Kira and Tim's project. We all know that such examples exist. That is, examples of oppression, of exclusion, of violence against queers in a rural context. We also know them in urban contexts too. We know of death, of untimely death, in both contexts. Of course, certain narratives of progress, I'm not sure I am subscribing to all of them or to most of them. But certain narratives of progress would argue that such stories of marginalization, institutionalized exclusion, normativized violence against queers, and perhaps more so against queers in a rural context, are now becoming a thing of the past. Things are changing, could be a narrative. We may wish to return to this question and ask actually whether things are changing. But the reason I have started with this story from Greece is not in order to debate whether we should be mourning instead of celebrating. I don't want to rain on anybody's parade today. I wanted to use this story in order to be able to better ask a set of questions which I hope we will be able to return to in the Q&A and perhaps debate. So, my questions are, what do we mean when we talk about queer and rural? These are words that are historically specific, but also 
changing. Analytically, they have been used differently. They are also very fluid, but they also position us in the way we use them. What, who, how, when is queer? Who, where, when is the rural happening? Huh? What type of narrative do these words, especially these words put together, recall for us today? Is the narrative of community, of uh, potential, of agency, of return, decisiveness, happiness, success, inclusion? Or is it the opposite? Exclusion, solitude, forced migration, violence and failure? Or is it a thick and complicated history of both these opposite sets? Um, to stay with examples that are globally known, and uh, I mean, there is Brockwood Mountain, the love story, there is also Brooklyn Mountain, the ending. Uh, there is Brandon Tina's life. Uh, there is Brandon Tina's killing. There is Laramie, Wyoming, the life of Matthew Shepard, the killing of Matthew Shepard, the brutal killing of Matthew Shepard, but also the mobilization, empowerment, and inspiration that were enabled, enabled in his memory. All of that come as associations of, as narratives related to queer and rural. And I stayed with the ones that come kind of easily in a kind of globalized context. But also we should ask how geographically and um, to an extent culturally specific are these narratives of rural and queer? How can we account uh, for that? For instance, uh, I know for you British, rural, the word rural means completely, it's something completely different to me. When you pair it with queer, I mean, <laughs> the, the word rural means something different in North and South America, even in the East and the West Coast, it brings different associations. And again, when you pair it with queer, it does bring different associations. Uh, think of the difference, even I was thinking, even in my Greek context, the word rural means something completely different when you think of the mainland and we think, when you think of an island. And uh, here I can share a very private anxiety as I was growing up. I always had this image of those islands we used to go, which islands we knew in the winter had 100, 150 inhabitants. Uh, how does one how can one live as a queer person in, in a small island of 100 people? This was actually an anxiety when I was growing up. And this in a country, I should say, that sports islands as um, queer destinations for tourism in the summer. Sometimes the same islands. How much inflected by social class, economic equality, economic inequality, crypto-colonialism, and race are these questions of queer rurality bound to be? And um, here I should mention that we should not forget how much the rural has been a key fantasy for queer world making for a very long time. And certainly for the last century or so. From von Gledens, the Baron von Gledens, South Italy, homoerotic photography, to Michel Foucault settling briefly in Sidi Lusail in Tunisia in 1969, and from Edward Carpenter's Derbyshire, Derbyshire, to the iconography of the gay and lesbian paradises of Mykonos and Lesbos, the island paradises of Mykonos and Lesbos in Greece. I mean, there's a history there of queer fantasy that comes from the center, and projects onto the rural. And this is a complicated history, also in terms of class, race, crypto-colonialism, orientalism, and so on. Um, the last question is how much space for the underrepresented and the non-representable do the assemblages of queer and rural leave? In the past, but also in the present. Every time we unearth a story 
of queer rurality, what is there at that moment not being said? What is unsayable, unrepresentable, non-archivable, non-archived every time we speak, for instance, of Edward Carpenter in the Russia? I had these and similar questions as I was coming into contact with these projects, I must admit, but I also must admit that Kieran Tim's work has made me revisit these questions and has made me rethink potential openings to answer them. I will share as my final points some of these openings, um, and I will focus on three concepts mainly that are, of course, central in our discussion today. Uh, I will share how I think of them. These will be queer rurality, queer archiving, and cultural practice. So let me take them in, ter in terms. Queer rurality. Of course, okay, let's face it. Every time you speak about queer rural, um, we do it also today. Uh, in the back of one's mind is gay urban, as the urban. I mean, you can complicate that. But isn't it also this conceptual pair um, present? But are these two opposite? Is the gay urban the opposite of queer rural? What I would suggest is that rather than standing in opposition to each other, these terms seem to be suggesting a dialectic, seem to be intertwined in a dialectic that is very present and often recalled in people's lives, in people's oral histories. I remind you um, the um, oral history project that we're celebrating today in the video, I saw, I, saw, I saw so many times people saying, you know, I went to London and then came back, or I was planning my going to this or other metropolitan area, and then I rethought, and um, the metropolitan is there, as are also other forms of living one's sexual identity. And is there in a dialogue with what you, at any point, would call um, queer rurality, queer rural. I would therefore suggest that it might be more productive to start thinking of the two not as often, but engaged in a complex haunting. I mean, queer rural being haunted by the gay urban, uh, the idea of the non metropolitan sexuality being haunted by its metropolitan counterpart, and vice versa. Um, think of my example, Dimitra of Lesbos was ordering to mail in um, catalogs or dresses, and I am being haunted by Dimitra of Lesbos. Of course, I am producing, I'm proposing this model of uh, complex haunting in order for us to be able at the same analytical level to discuss how the various, um, the various concepts that were used are always haunted by their others, you know, um, queer by gay, um, historical positions, haunting by potentials that didn't or could have happened and so on. I'm also, of course, speaking advisedly, because here we are haunted by the lives of people that were lived or not lived or not able. Second opening I wanted to suggest is this idea of queer archive. And here I, 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 I added this slash there, queer slash archive, in order to make us think a little bit of the intersections of the two. And I wanted to say two, three things. The first is that queers are already in the archive. I mean, because they have been noted. They're being in surveillance or afraid of surveillance in biopolitical check, in archives of dissidents and unconforming, in never ending lists or in the fear of never ending lists. They have been a constant trouble in the archive, real and notional, how to catalog them, but also cataloging them. There is, there is a moment in um, Tim's video there 
what I believe her name is Desi, um, describes how she opened her bar. And um, she says she went to the police or to another office to um, um, sign the documents. And then the person who was there accepting the documents said, ah, okay, you're opening this bar, um, Sunday queer night bar um, in this small area. Okay, we, we now will know where, where to find you, where you will be. There's always, you know, queers are archived. They are in the archive and they know it. Queers also do archives. And with this, I mean, they have their own understanding of being in an archive. They also create their own archives, their own collections, their own memorabilia, or even their own archives of feeling. And they often take the trouble they have become in the archive, in the official archive, and transform it into archive trouble. This is why I'm saying that the question of queer archiving is always already a genealogical one. We can return to this um, later on. It is also a political gesture. Remember that um, documentary on the image that I spoke to you about? You can see there that Dimitra has her own collection. Maybe it's a collection of DVDs, of CDs, it's a collection of photographs. She wants to be um, photographed in front of memorabilia, her own house in which she invites us. There is an archive there, and she knows that putting it out in the public already creates archive trouble. She's there and she demands a space. The last or rather penultimate opening I want to produce to think through is this idea of archaeology and archive. I'll be brief here. But of course, the stories you have seen today and we will can discuss are always um, full of um, moments of archaeology or even media archaeology. Um, you may have heard um, in the video, in, the, in, in, in Tim's play, there is so much talk about, you know, pubs that have closed down, um, the difference of uh, the pride in the past or now, how the things are changing, uh, how lives were so much different and even encounters were different in the 1920s and so on. This kind of archaeology may indeed indicate absence, change, radical difference from the past. But now, we are archive as a noun and as a verb, as a genealogical gesture, also means weaving links, lines, textures, texts, and radical presence. Which brings me to the last point, which is just a phrase. What I've tried today is to share my, I am, my understanding of queer archive as a cultural practice, a cultural practice as enabling queer archive. I hope we can discuss some of these ideas later on, and thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you, Demetrius. Uh, and sorry for some of the sound there on the pre-record, but um, we will have we'll all be together for the Q and A, so we can put some more of those questions uh, then. But a really fascinating uh, talk, and again, moving from that very that individual story there into these wider implications, and I think that interesting of what do queer and rural mean independently, but when you put it together, is I think that's a yeah. There's so much we can talk about around that, so we'll we'll come to that hopefully in the Q and A. Um, so now we're just going to have our final uh, extract uh, reading, uh, and we're about to meet Jay, who was a non-binary person living in North Wales and moved to North Wales um, and was building a house there. And uh, we're also going to meet George, who is a uh, cisgender male uh, farmer in his early 50s. So let's just hear that scene. It always takes longer to build things than you think it will. We managed to get hold of this reclaimed wood from a neighbour. It'll work for the floorboards out back. I've been up at six most mornings, and we work on the house sometimes till ten at night. It's taken a lot longer than I thought to get this house into shape. 
It's all been a case of learning on the job. Oh, I love the smell of wood. And I like the rhythm of being outside. You don't get that so much in the city. You have to work with the weather here. I hear you wanting to put up a fence. Morning, George. I have to say you haven't made a complete hash of it. <laughs> of what? With the house. Ah, oh, we took your advice on the beams. How many have you been working on it? In all, nearly ten of us. And you're all, you were, you like, everyone is... Queer, yes. Yeah, we're, all, we're all queer. Oh, queer, okay. Queer. Don't some people find that word offensive? Some people don't like it. Others do. Reclaim words, George. Oh. Right. What? Like reclaimed wood. I take the old wood, sand it out, and make it new for me. It's the same with words like queer. So, you want to talk about the fences? I just want to make sure you know you'll need perimeter fencing and interior fencing for sheep. Sounds good to me. Are you bringing it all the way down to the stream? Is that all right? I reckon you're going to want ox stream posts for that. W what are they? They're octagonal shaped posts. They work on all kinds of ground. If there's one thing you don't want out here, it's bad, bad fencing. fencing. <laughs> It's a nice job you've made of the house. We're going to have a get-together in a couple of weeks when we're done with the main structure. If you fancy coming over for some food and beer. Yeah. Never been known to turn down a meal. Better get on. Thanks for the advice on the fencing. I've lived all over. In the cities. But you know... As a queer non-binary person coming here to North Wales, that to me feels more activist than going to Pride in London. It's like those conversations you have every day in the village. Like when I'm at the school and the parents ask me questions. It's in the negotiation of things. That's what community is. And there are a lot of queer people around here. That's why we built this house together. As a way for queer people to share skills and learn new ones. Thank you, and that's uh, William Wynne Davies and Tigger Blaze acting uh, and reading there for us, thank you. So, um, before we move on to the Q&A, I would like to present our last talk, uh, and really this Queer Rural Connections would not have happened without uh, Dr. Kira Ullman's support and work through all of this, and so much work through all of this. Um, so Kira, who's based at the Centre for Socio-Legal Studies and um, has been doing their own project on broadband uh, and rural communities and looking at community networks in rural locations. So I'll hand over to you. Great. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Trade places. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for uh, the introduction, Tim. Um, I'm going to try to use my iPad here uh, instead of paper. Um, so I, I've kind of, I, I've really had a hard time titling this talk. Um, so I, I could leave it untitled, but I'll give you my most recent title, um, which is Queerness in Unnatural Environments, Constructing Identity in Constructed Spaces. And I'm kind of hoping that the title is actually a prompt for a conversation. It's definitely not fixed. It was just, like I said, the last thing that came into my head. Um, so I'm going to start with a quote. Oh, I could live there. Honestly, I love the nature. I love kind of just being out there because then it's about you. You don't have to worry about what the neighbor might say down the road because of a close-knit community. You're just you. And the trees can't judge you. The bees can't judge you. So it makes you just feel so much more happier. That's a quote from one of our queer rural participants, Tia, who lives in Suffolk. You can hear her say these words in her own voice, which sounds very different to mine. <laughs> I'm uh, obviously not British. Um, at the very opening of the Queer Rural Connections film, which accompanies the stars are brighter here, the live play that you've watched some scenes from today. 
And I'm opening with it because it captures an important theme that is emerging from our interviews with LGBTQIA people in and from rural areas. In qualitative interview-based research, our data is people's own words. And when we talk about analyzing that data, what we usually mean is that we're looking for themes patterns of topics, ideas, expressions that turn disparate individual viewpoints into insights about social life and shared experience. Now, I want to preface what I'm about to say with an important caveat, which is that this is very much a work in progress. Queer Rural Connections, as Tim mentioned at the outset, is a living project, and you're catching us kind of right in the middle of it. What I'm going to talk about today are preliminary observations, ideas that I think are worth exploring. These are, in short, the connections that I'm actively making among the interviews we've heard and the literature that I know. And like all connections, they're highly contingent. One of our aims in this project was a bit of an activist one. We wanted to decenter queer aesthetics from urban metropolitan spaces, by spotlighting rural experiences of queerness. How are the tensions between acceptance and rejection of a socially marginalized and often stigmatized identity enacted and experienced, subverted, and even celebrated in these different domains? It's right there, staring at us in the title of the project, queer. This word carries all the contradictions, a fraught history of rejection and acceptance, reclamation. And words have come to matter in really interesting ways in this project, ways we didn't expect for a team of researchers and artists who thought a lot about the language we would use for this endeavor. Rural places, we hear time and time again, are a lot like other socially constructed spaces. They can be hostile or supportive, repressive or accepting. But the countryside, nature, doesn't need queering. It is already queer. So I said that Tia's quote summarizes a theme, and that theme is the reassurance of nature, the non-judgment, if not neutrality, almost, of the natural wor world. Here's what another one of our participants, Adria, said in her interview. Actually, when I was going through my really dark period, I do remember going up to one cliff. I can't remember if it was like Dunwich Heath or something like that. And just going and standing on the edge of the cliff, screaming really loudly, just make it all stop. So yeah, I've screamed at the sea. But actually, recently, I was up there, and it was just so beautiful watching the marsh harriers, and you've got the heathland. And I mean, it's just, it's a place that gives you peace, doesn't it? and calm and tranquility and beauty and all those nice things. It's very restorative, I guess. Nature can hold all of this. Nature can hold all of us. It can handle the screaming turmoil of human life and still give us peace. This is a theme that's coming out in a lot of the conversations that we're having. One of the things participants in Queer Rural Connections like about rurality is this closeness to nature. Many of them have lived in more urban environments at times in their lives, but they're drawn back to the countryside. In my talk today, I want to focus on the disconnections between constructed spaces and unconstructed ones, or the ones we perceive as unconstructed. The natural environment in our interviews repeatedly appears as the unconstructed space. In particular, I'd like to reflect on the ways in which thinking about social construction of physical spaces, like urban cities and rural villages, can inform our thinking about the digital spaces, which I will suggest are also human-made, socially embedded, built environments that stand in opposition in some interesting ways to the physical, undomesticated countryside. Now, I study media and digital inequalities, so I'm generally interested in the disconnections and disjunctures between online and offline worlds and how they are intertwined with locality, local geographies, narratives, and identities. 
So I came to this project wondering how the internet is shaping and shaped by queer rural life. What disconnections is it overcoming? What disconnections is it creating? How is digitization creating or defining what connectivity is in rural places, human and technological? Now, feminist, queer, and queer feminist science and technology studies scholars have made important contributions to our understanding of technology as socially embedded and constructed. But let me start with the idea of the built environment. When we think of cities, this is probably the image that they evoke in our heads, towering buildings, paved streets, traffic lights. It is a space constructed by humans for humans. Cities can, uh, sorry, cities can embody powerful ordering logics. Think of the difference between cities arranged in rigid grid patterns versus those that have evolved as a patchwork of neighborhoods crisscrossed by crooked alleyways and cut-throughs. Think of the grandiosity of Hausmann's Parisian boulevards exported to the heart of downtown Cairo and emulated in Mumbai. But the vision of an urban designer is not the only structuring logic of a city. No. Cities are vibrant social and economic centers, too. People are drawn there for cultural, educational, economic reasons. People from all walks of life. This is where they get their reputation for being melting pots. Social mores change more quickly in cities, where people mix with other people. They are spaces of experimentation, danger, disturbance. They are subverted and reshaped by the people who occupy them, and it is these kinds of places we might first think of when we conjure a gay scene or a queer scene in our minds. Nightclubs, activism, pride. Culture and cities are entwined in our imaginations. This is probably why so many of our participants have talked about this allure of the city. Set up in opposition to their rural context, the city was where they could go to be queer. So the city is a real and an imagined place. It is both physically and socially constructed. Made by humans for humans, it can be a space of radical acceptance or radical rejection. Acceptance or discomfort. And you know what? The internet, it turns out, is like that too. Some of our younger participants in particular grew up with the internet as an escape from rural life, much like the city, the way it's been described by a few of our panelists today. It allowed them to access communities they had never seen in real life, in physical life, in their local context. It created space to explore themselves quietly, even secretly, a space they could go to without even having to leave the village. One participant, Tom, said that the fact he lived so far away from a town meant that he missed out on certain opportunities. Quote, because you couldn't really do anything without a long walk or a long car ride or a long bus journey or something. It kind of restricted me, end quote. Instead, he turned to online chat rooms. The internet offered virtual mobility in the face of relative physical immobility. Zelly, another one of our participants, said the internet is a big lifeline that makes people feel less alone. It's kind of helped me make peace with parts of my identity. And this is important. Like the city, the digital world, from chat rooms to social media, can be subversive, expansive, exploratory space. But it is a bit easier to forget, or maybe even not notice, that digital spaces are built environments too. They are constructed, socially and materially. Digital spaces have designers and users. What they are, what kind of place they can be, is made up at the intersection of design, use, and functionality. This is something that I've been exploring in some of my other work, the geography of constructed digital places. So I'd like to encourage us today to consider what it's like to move through a digital space as a space constructed. So let's take the example of a space like, say, Instagram. It has been constructed, Instagram, along a single linear boulevard. You can only scroll up and down. There are no side streets, but if you want to go somewhere else on the platform, there are some other options. 
clicking on a location tag, for instance, on one of the photos you come across on this boulevard will take you to a map. Underneath the map, you may see other photos that share the same location tag. You can click on them. They appear on a grid. One of those photos might have some hashtags, hashtag Suffolk Pride. Now you're scrolling through photos of the event. Have you landed in a queer space? Can you see other queer avenues, boulevards, nightclubs from here? Some of the posts might have other hashtags, hashtag LGBTQ rights, hashtag gay life. You cannot move completely freely in a constructed digital space, just like you can't walk through the wall of a building to a street on the other side when you're in a city. But you can choose your own path, sort of. Because it is a constructed space, it is not neutral or natural. It is built materially, technically, socially, and therefore it can be uncomfortable because it imposes certain logics on our human experience. And these logics are often informed by the heteronormative white, male, and Anglo-European perspectives of technology designers. And this is what feminist STS scholars have been telling us. And this is important to consider when we talk about queer spaces, how much space, whether online or offline, rural, urban, or something in between, influences our ways of knowing and being in the world. How space is epistemically productive, in other words. Because technologies of communication, like the internet, are constructed spaces. They also intervene in our epistemic world in the view of scholars like Wendy Espeland and Mitchell Stevens. Socio-legal scholar Sally Engel Mary writes in the section of quantification that rather than revealing truth, technologies can actually create it, making, no, making known one reality among many possibilities. This prescriptive aspect of technologies like the internet it, as a constructed space also comes through in our interviews, but a bit more subtly. So for instance, Tia, whose quote opened my talk today, says, the internet is not always so great on overcoming yourself. You tend to put so many labels on yourself. You put yourself into boxes. As Jeffrey Boker and Susan Lee Starr write in their book, Sorting Things Out, Classification and Its Consequences, quote, all information systems are active creators of categories in the world as well as simulators of existing categories. What would queer categorization as a practice look like? What is possible in queering data as scholars like Bonnie Ruberg and Spencer Ruelos ask us to consider? Seen from this perspective, we should take as a central question in this Queer Rural Connections project, how the spaces we go to in order to escape classification, and this may be fleeing the small town for the city or going online to find acceptance that isn't available in the village hall, how these spaces we es escape to also do classific <laughs> sorry, classificatory work can't say this word all of a sudden, um, how they also classify things. <laughs> how are they created by and for us? What creative power do we exercise within their built environment? Earlier, I said that nature was already queer. But I wonder whether what I mean is that it actually exists outside of these human technological practices of categorization. Is it that labels, categories, cannot be operationalized in the same way in the natural landscape, process, sorted, coded, filtered? We do not need to be categorized to be read out there. Knowledge has a different kind of order. What radical rejections of classification are possible on this wild horizon? Lauren, another of our participants, says in her interview that what she loves about the countryside is being able to see things change. The seasons change, the wildlife changes, there's life, there's death, there's dormancy. It is a zone of constant rebirth and rejuvenation. That fluidity stands in some kind of important opposition to regimes of knowing, moving, and being that are circumscribed in the delineations bet between straight and queer, rural and urban, online and offline. This is not a project to queer the countryside. 
but it is becoming, I think, in some ways, a project in which the countryside is offering a different perspective on queerness, on the boundaries we draw and violate between concepts as ephemeral, as rural, and urban. And I'll leave it there as a provocation for our discussion. Thank you so much, Kira. Um, it's fascinating, yeah, thinking, I think some of the questions that will come up shortly in the Q&A, when we talk about belonging and that, that difference between the online and the, uh, the, the geography, I suppose, of the online world and the choices that we have there, that's a really fascinating sort of, yeah, parallel and thing to think about where it's different. Um, great, so we're going to take a, a minute or two now and then we're going to move into a Q&A section, I think. And uh, I know we've got some questions that are being filtered on through the online channel. Um, and maybe the best way to sort of work through that is if, we, if we've got a few of us that want to sort of comment on it, we, I'll, I'll pass it around. Do, and do we have, uh, Demetrius is, is, uh, is with us, yeah. Um, so we'll just make sure we've, we've got him available. And I know uh, also there is uh, the hello, torch on. Hello. Oh, hello. We're here. Hello. Hello. Good to see you. Um, good to see you. And we've also, um, there's an online survey, I think, torch. You've, uh, we've sent the link. So if you're following us uh, online, do take a moment to fill that in as, as well. Um, yes, it's lovely to have us all here. So thank you. Um, Thank you, actors, wonderful readings as well from, from, from the play. But thank you to all of the speakers today. There's some fascinating um, discussions coming up there. Um, and I've noticed uh, some of the questions there to do with this sense of belonging in the rural space, um, which I think also relates to when we think about the uh, aligning these words and queer and rural together. Um, so I just wonder, I don't know if all four of us have something to say on uh, that, that first provocation that you brought, Demetrius, about what happens when we bring queer and rural together, and does that sort of shift our sense of what each of those words might mean? Um, and I don't know if you want to sort of expand on that uh, that, that point first, Demetrius, uh, uh, sort of pulling, giving us a bit more sort of questioning around, yeah, what happens when we put those two words together, and uh, what the, what's that been like in the research that you've, you've been doing? Yeah, I mean... Um, sorry for the public work. Uh, um, well, the whole project um, asks exactly that. What happens when we put these two words together? Um, I'm not sure, though, um, whether it is as simple as uh, you know something that we could uh, just try today. I mean, of course, queer remains a constant question. Um, it starts from a questioning, starts from a, uh, various forms of not competing, um, various impositions of non belonging, and it is a work of belonging, of desiring. Um, and I don't know whether these, put together with Uro, could problematize the various ideas about rural. This is, uh, it was my provocation. I mean, how can we reclaim the rural uh, from a queer perspective? What uh, have all these um, historical moments that uh, you came and you're uh, uh, picking up uh, from the rich historical archive say about the rural? Uh, um, but I want to also um, ask the panel, um, um, I, I found very interesting what you all said. How, how what is the medium through which we ask this question about queer humanity? How urban is our medium? I think that's, uh, it, yeah. Uh, uh, or is this not important? Um, queer theory itself uh, has been uh, something uh, thought through and written in big centers, mostly, hmm. or so I think. Um, our um, media, our channels now, somehow um, resting on centralized um, controls and powers. So 
our framing of the question of the rural somehow is bound to be very much related to the urban entry. Um, so that's, that's something I want to put. I think that's in, yeah. I think that's interesting, and I, maybe Catherine can speak more in a bit about the East Anglia in terms of the ed, in terms of that division between urban and rural from an education perspective. I know from the interviews that we've been doing that that idea of rural is very it's a very controversial word because, uh, for example, in the play that one of the the characters from the north doesn't even we wouldn't even conceive of East Anglia being a rural space. You know, they refer to it being a garden, a sort of more landscaped space, and they, for them their understanding of rural even wouldn't include that. It would be a sort of semi, a sort of a suburban space almost, or that a lot of these villages they almost feel like a suburban space with, with quite you know it's a commuter belt territory potentially, and so there's there's definitely even within the British example there's lots of different understandings of what that word rural might mean. Um, before you even bring the queerness into it, there would be sort of con contrast there. I don't know from a sort of education perspective, what are there are there things you might you might say. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I mean, I think a, a lot of our teachers in in the study talked about um, the the anonymity of of existing and teaching in in a in an urban environment, and the, the this idea of sort of um, being able to hide in plain sight in the city, so that it was unlikely that they lived near. The, the children that they that they were teaching and the families that they were teaching um, and this idea that in contrast in in rural school communities um, there's nobody there there's lots of space there's um, there's far fewer people but you are um, you are so much more visible and um, uh, and known by everybody, and there is this this idea that people need to know who you are and be able to to categorise you in a way that there isn't a thirst to to do that in in cities. So, um, it, it, you know, ironically, when when we had the the, the problems that, that I described earlier on, we moved into a rental house on a 250 acre agricultural estate <laughs> that was no near neighbours um, and we, we actively looked for no near neighbours but the people that we met there I knew you know they knew far more about us and we knew far more about them than than had we gone to to live in London for example um, so I, th I think it goes back to surveillance and for me the idea of being um, the seer or the seen. And then not anonymity or how anonymous you can be in either space. Yep. As well. Absolutely. Kira, from an online perspective and the imagery that we get in terms of aligning this queer and rural together, uh, is there stuff in your work that, um, in terms of what images do we see? Do we see, do, do we see a queer rural space at all in terms of when you're on Instagram or, is, or, or does it tend to be sort of urban imagery? I'm just interested if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I think that's a really interesting question that I'm kind of hoping to explore actually a lot more as the project develops um, and in light of some of the insights that our interviewees are bringing to the table in terms of where they go online when they talk about online. Um, but I think in general, I mean, it depends a lot on the platform, and this is why I tried to make this point very clear in my talk about how platforms are built environments, that the designers have a particular aesthetic often in, in mind when they when they develop a, a platform. And so if you take a platform like Instagram, which was the example that, that I chose, uh, uh, there there is a particular visual aesthetic to Instagram that has nothing to do with uh, queerness necessarily, um, but it's a particular uh, aesthetic about the kinds of places that are photographable and deserve to be on the platform. Um, what this aesthetic does is, um, I think anyone who's an Instagram user will be familiar with this, it basically it replicates itself across the platform. So um, the same kinds of places, the same kinds of scenes get photographed more frequently. And um, so, you know, there are, there are a number of kind of Instagram aesthetics that are well known, things like a, a, a 
a minimalist uh, decorated room with a lot of green plants in it, for instance. There's a joke about, you know, the more plants you have, the more Instagrammable uh, a room is. And this gets replicated. And what you see is, you know, more and more cafes in London, for instance, will have green plants everywhere because everybody will, will photograph it. Um, and so uh, invariably, um, the, there is a convergence of imagery on certain platforms around certain themes. And the urban does tend to dominate. The urban or sort of the extreme rural, but when you talk about identifying something as like queer, um, a queer experience, the things that get tagged with hashtags around that, right, which then which then create sort of like a, a conversation around queerness, um, they do tend to converge on these particular platform aesthetics, do tend to veer in the direction of, uh, of the urban. But I want to emphasize that this is like very anecdotal at the moment based on kind of like a lot of my preliminary explorations um, of sort of hashtag culture and things like this on these platforms. Um, and it deserves, I think, a much more thorough um, an investigation and a much more um, methodical investigation um, into exactly uh, what that visual is and, and what those spaces actually look like. But as you can tell, it's, it's about the convergence of how users are using the platform, where they're going, what they're photographing, for instance, or how they're tagging things, and what the platform kind of encourages users, nudges users to do in order to, uh, for instance, in the case of, of a platform like Instagram, keep them on the platform mm -hmm. because that's the, the business model for the platform. So it's, it's a convergence of these different impetuses actually all working to create what, what we might identify as like a, a queer space um, in, in a particular online domain. That we do actually have a couple of other questions. Yes, yes, I can yes, um, bring yeah. another one in from, uh, from our online participants. Um, so one question that came in for all the panelists um, is, I, I wonder if any of the panelists might be able to reflect on how the experience of belonging might differ, differ in urban versus rural places, whether LGBTQ people depend on being connected to other LGBT people, as in, as in urban places, or whether they can form a deep sense of belonging with non-LGBT people too, which may be the only option in rural places. So yeah, anyone wants to um, I'll, I'll start. I'll start because that reminds me of one of the participants. Uh, well, there were several who commented on this, but uh, the person we refer to as Kevin in, in the play. Um, uh, for them, it was the sense of belonging actually came around being in the garden and working on on the land itself, and that they would have lots of friends who were doing. Uh, that kind of work and that's where their friendships were formed that's where their sense of community was and actually they their their LGBT identity wasn't a particularly huge part wasn't wasn't particularly important for them to express they they did acknowledge the lack of a queer rural space near to them and that that was I think problematic and several of our participants have commented on that 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 that's what's frustrating sometimes is that you know, occasionally they would like to go to these spaces, um, but but in a, a sense, it wasn't a massive. Their their sexuality wasn't as big a part of their identity as as having their gardening club or community and being outside. And I think those were stronger senses of of, of what made them belong to somewhere or to community or, or to a place. And that and, and that resonated with several of our participants. Um, uh, Dimitris, I'm going to try and hold the microphone just because I'm up close to you, but uh, do you have a sense of what you would say in, in response to that question of belonging? Yeah, um, you tell me whether, whether this is okay for you need to. Um, um, well, I, I, I hope thinking that um, I'm not sure whether holding the microphone is the best uh, idea. But, uh, you know what you think is best. But, um, what I wanted to say anyway is that um, with the rural as a concept, we have this. Uh, we have been accustomed to think that everything is possible, and at the same time that nothing is possible. In terms of identity, for instance, in terms of landscape, of course, in terms of religions, uh, in terms of community building in terms of identity as well. There is not a sense of relief and uh, the other way that you can do things, the other way that you can return to the family, for instance. 
and it's very much, I wonder whether it is related to the idea um, that we have of faith, and that we have of lived experience of faith, how much the rural seems to always be the space we make ourselves. You know, the a gardening club in a rural area is a real gardening uh, uh, club. Uh, the gardening club, I don't know, in you know, Oxford is somehow an imitation, uh, always prescribed, always fabricated. So we have this idea of the rural a little bit like the, the kind of uh, um, the, the, the real beginning of, 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 uh, um, of creativity, right? And at the same time, there is this idea of the rural as surveillance, as warm, as nothing is possible, precisely for the reason uh, that we have talked about today. And uh, the queer experience is interesting here, precisely because it can give us different dimensions to do all that. And the, the question is very good because uh, I think I have heard myself from um, people who live um, part of their life, say of their sexuality moments in rural uh, places, especially in the uh, last day with, uh, of new platforms, um, you know, uh, Grindr and so on. Um, and uh, it seems that they follow that narrative, as you have just said. Um, at the same time, I'm wondering um, how this can be a little complicated. I was moved uh, to get to mention its esteem, um, the series. Um, in its esteem, uh, it's, it, it, it's interesting that this series about the experience of HIV AIDS in Britain was warped, or rather haunted, by the Isle of Wight by a family in the Isle of Wight. And I'm wondering whether we have to see the story um, in, in its complexity and see how this very idea of the brittle uh, connection to the root being in the Isle of Wight in that series, for those of you who have seen it, was held by the mother basically somehow got it wrong. Um, to, to an important extent, and without respect to the fact that this fictional character lost the fun. Um, but I think the point of the series is that it was both something very real. This is why the character, sorry for the spoiler, that in the end decides to back to the end of life. It was both that and very impressive. And, and my answer to the question would be that it can be both, and it can be both at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, both liberating in one way, different relationships construct, and then at the same time um, be haunted by all of the uh, different um, um, forms of surveillance and um, risk taking and um, bordering uh, that can come with it. Thank you. I'm going to just stop there just because it's getting very broken up. Um, yes, the idea of the haunting that you raise as a way, rather than things being in complete opposition and that the the city is always there in, in in these other rural spaces, but the rural we we take with us. And 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 I think that's an interesting point as well that we maybe think of the rural too much as a as a as an uncreated space when actually it has been landscaped and created a lot. Um, uh, Catherine, uh, what are your thoughts on that that question of belonging? Thank you. Um, I mean, from a personal perspective, I, was, I think Betty's was an important place for, for belonging as far as my experiences of, of Suffolk were, were concerned. And uh, I, just reflecting on that, I, I see Ali very frequently um, at a, a local quiz that we go to, which I think says quite a lot about <laughs> how we've both got to, quite a lot older. Um, but uh, there's still quite a number of LGBT people that, that go to that quiz and, and almost that sort of sense of a, a bit of a, a kind of gay takeover of, of, of the quiz. But um, I mean, I'm part of a, a friendship group that's sort of, we've been friends for sort of 25, 30 years and um, our sense of belonging was 
was loosely based around Ipswich Hockey Club, where um, my partner played hockey and, and a number did, that w where we all kind of congregated together. And that felt like a safe space just because so many of the team were, were, were gay. Um, and as we've, you know, we, we've all got, got older and um, like to go to bed earlier, um, we, that, that, that's those safe, those safe spaces spaces those safe rural spaces um are now each other's houses um and and thinking as well it's such a small community it was such a small community in in and around ipswich and suffolk that many of us within the group have ac actually had relationships at any one time over the years with more than one m more than one person but such is the need to um to maintain a sense of belonging actually you you stay friends, you get over it, you, you, you build bridges, you, you manage with... A communal understanding of relationship. Yeah, well. uh, uh, because, because what's the, you know, the alternative is, you know, somewhere else, you know, somewhere else com completely. And, and I've been interested in what Kira had to say, because the lockdown was the first time in which we as a group used social media and and zoom to to start to connect um and that won't go now um there's a real a real sense of that being an important space in which we you know share jokes and tease each other and and share you know make arrangements to go out all of those sorts of things and i, I think Perhaps without the pandemic, we wouldn't have necessarily um, existed in that space. Thank you. I mean, actually, this is sort of a question I want to put to the actors as well in this sense of belonging with um, having done the play and getting to sort of study these voices and these characters. For both of you, I mean, how for you, what that sense of belonging in the queer community and, and your understanding of queer rural how has that developed through working on, on these voices and these characters? Do you have sort of thoughts or feelings about that? <laughs> well, I was thinking in response to that actual question that came up that I'm, I'm from Guernsey in the Channel Islands and it's nine miles by three. It's quite a small place. <laughs> and um, I feel like when I was growing up there, I, was, I felt like I belonged there. Like I really have a, had a sense of um, allegiance to Guernsey and I a real feeling that I belonged. However, I wasn't bringing my whole self there. So I belonged, but only in the way that I was allowing myself to belong maybe. And that it was going to London and going off to drama school that I wanted to not belong anywhere, that I wanted to completely be um, anonymous and it was a being anonymous in London that allowed me to kind of find that missing bit of me that I wasn't bringing to my whole self um, and now I feel like I'm in a kind of mixed place where I sometimes want to belong in those spaces and I sometimes just want to be a person in the world and not be a queer person who has to be in a queer space all the time kind of thing so I feel that doing the play and and listening to you know the voices of of these people who um, you know come from rural communities, who I, I just a lot of it I really did um, kind of you know I felt I, I understood a lot of it I felt I understood, but then some of the characters who didn't move away, I just I just think how on earth, I, and it's amazing that they've managed to kind of you know realise their full selves. Yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of what occurred to me. Um, I'm from uh, Gateshead in Tyne and Weir, and I, I, I was struggling a little bit. I was thinking, oh, what, do I, what am I going to say? And then when you, you started talking to I began to think about the feeling of belonging. And in a strange sort of way, there's something about Tyneside as a place that I think's quite a, re uh, quite a good blend of you've you, the the um the countryside and and um I guess rural attitudes and whatnot you know pervade quite near to the the sort of mm. the metropolitan centre um and so I think in discovering my own sexuality um 
and working in the city um, and sort of gravitating towards that and then sort of thinking, ah, yes, a bit like in the play when they talk about um, uh, going to university is there. Mm. Um, I never went to university, but that was sort of my university experience of like going to city, working in the city, meeting sort of, you know, gays for the first time, um, which was like, oh, they're really, they're really confident with their gayness. And it was, <laughs> it was um, alarming. And then I was like, oh no, actually, I thought, oh, that's me. And then, um, and then I had sort of aspirations to, to go to London and to kind of mm. c climb that <laughs> proverbial ladder in my head of like, oh, I'll, I'll sort of, um, you know, I had delusions of grandeur as uh, <laughs> my academic prowess, which was actually quite small. Um, anyway, and so what now I reflect on is actually, I never, I, I've never, I kind of lied to myself. I, wa I wanted to sort of climb the ladder out of that and then realize actually, you know, that's, that's a massive part of who I am. Um, and I don't think I could ever leave it behind. Mm. Um, and even the way we think about it as a ladder, and it might not even be a ladder, you know, this idea of that one thing is a, there's a hierarchy when there maybe isn't, you know, or that maybe we need to sort of deconstruct that, you know, that London is the A game or whatever. And actually, well, what you were talking there is also there seemed to be an overlap between the rural leading into the gates head. And so that, I, you know, what Demetrius was talking about, actually, the rural is there in the urban and the urban is there in the rural in a very lived way in those in in places that aren't london or manchester these major major metropolitan spaces so for I sure and, and and i i worked with and knew several and many kind of perfectly comfortable and uh um you know you know gay men in particular like in in, in theaters and whatnot um who were sort of living that that rural working class well i say not rural but like that overlapped working class um lgbt existence um and that was kind of, that is quite inspiring mm. to me mm. that I think that that's, that's where I'm headed. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kira, did you want to reflect on that? We've got another question. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so. Yeah. So. Um, okay, so another uh, question that we have, um, which uh, is uh, was originally for Catherine and your work, but I actually think it could apply more broadly, but we'll start with Catherine. Um, the question is that queer often leads us to be critical of norms and norm normalization. So how do you navigate this in your work with normalizing LGBTQ plus identities and lives uh, in both the classroom and rural communities? Is this work to do with representation and inclusion? And if so, are there queer political sacrifices to be made in that domain? And to expand that question slightly, I think beyond education, there's a question about norms and normalization in other, in other domains. So, you know, for instance, the depiction of queer life in theater and film is another space um, in which I think this is a really valid question online spaces. It's valid there as well. But let's start with Catherine and your work in schools. I mean, I think I think it should be said that um, I'm I I don't work with schools directly anymore. Um, my work is essentially with um, with those looking to go into the the teaching profession, and um, through the leadership program that I do with 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 LGBT teachers, looking for positions of, of school leadership, and and I think fundamentally what I've seen um, change. And, and continue to change is the way in which um, there there is there is space for the, um, the teacher identity and the LGBTQ identity to coexist, um, and there are you know pride clubs are an example of um, the way in which children and young people are are getting access to support, um, you know, the relationships that they have with one another um, far more than, than, you know, certainly I remember even in my, even in my time as a teacher. Is, is there a sacrifice for any of this? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, I'm very aware of my, um, you know, I'm, from Rotherham in South Yorkshire, and my um, 
my working class roots um, and the way in which um, There's 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 almost there's that there's that intersection that there's that intersectionality of me um, I, I, that I and I'm not quite sure where that fits. I um, given the era that I tried to come out to my parents, that was very very difficult and remains very very difficult, um, and I still manage. Um, I still manage that side of me when I go go back to, to South Yorkshire. Um, and I've got to do lots more thinking about that, I think. Um, I'm going to try and... <laughs> I think it's this stereo here, is it, I think? Yeah, yeah we're going to... Uh, Demetrius, uh, so in terms of, yeah, do you feel like there's this normali uh, the normalisation and the, uh, do you have sort of reflections on that with any of the work you've been doing as well and whether there's any cost or sacrifice as well in terms of of that work <coughs> let's see if this um, will be better um, queer archive definitely you know, turning questioning the archive um, goes against various normativity uh, starts from the premise of something that uh, is not present or is not present enough through the normative. Um, so in, in a way, querying the archive, saying these other stories, what you are doing now um, works against various norms. Now, when you, though, um, anything, anything though that becomes more efficient, uh, of course, runs the risk of creating that is the, of the, and I was very much, I want to ask Kira actually, uh, whether uh, what she, uh, what she said about, um, you know, um, sort of, for instance, uh, how much Instagram creates norms that um, are not equally undermined. Um, it seems to me that what you were saying about, you know, image pictures, and all that creates banal norms uh, that we often not take into account as norms. They do become. Um, and how this plays out with the queer expression in Instagram or in the various apps that help people get together. So well, whether there is a um, normativizing aspect there happening under our eyes or in front of our eyes and under our rudder now. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know if you want to pick up on that. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, um, Dimitris, for the question. Um, it's actually really, I, I, it's more thought provoking than, I, than something that I have a, a sort of direct answer to at this point, I think. Um, but I, I do think that, um, that platforms, Instagram being one of them, uh, create um, normative conditions um, and and that that it's meaningful because those norms actually traverse the the sort of blurry boundary between the online and the offline. That actually they, um, the, the way in which uh, platforms kind of condition our behavior can manifest offline in certain ways. And I mean, the very uh, sort of simple e uh, example that I gave was this idea of sort of um, sites of, of photographic fixation, for instance, that, that become kind of magnetic sites for people uh, because they're old also kind of visually magnetic on certain platforms. Um, and that they uh, also create kind of, they, they um, engender certain behaviors uh, associated with how an object is photographed and things like that. Um, but I, I also think that um, in, in light of what you were saying about queer, queer archives and queer archive as you know a verb and a noun, there's something interesting happening, um, I, I think, in terms of, 
in terms of normativity and normalization uh, when it comes to memory and uh, and digital space as well. Um, and this is probably partly fresh in my mind because I, I recently read uh, this very thought-provoking book uh, by Ben Jacobson and Dave Beer on um, the automatic production of memory on social media platforms and the role of algorithms in performing memory tasks. And um, it's really kind of just an open question, but I'm sort of interested in how uh, algorithms are also working alongside human agency, for instance, to do that kind of um, that archiving work uh, in the in the verb sense, and what that means in terms of the ways in which um, marginalized communities are doing memory work between the online and the offline. Um, and I don't have any answer to that right now. It's just something that I find really interesting, and kind of yeah, the, your your comments about archives really got me thinking about that memory side of uh, social media traversals, for instance, um, and what what this means about our records of the past. And when we and when we look back, um, what what gets remembered and what gets forgotten, what the omissions are as a result of that sort of human technological agency. That's very interesting, picking up on the point of the archives with the two big projects we've been working with, Pride in Suffolk's Past and Broken Futures, which are archival projects about dealing with the problem of finding those queer voices within the archive that, as Dimitri has already said, that we're all, they're already there. Um, but because of history and the, the sort of cataloging biases have been lost, haven't been tapped into, and often the people doing that work initially are volunteers who want to do that work. And there's something very, I feel, uh, it just feels uh, in terms of that work, it's being done by people who want to find that and, and stories that are gonna mean something to them because they actively have a stake in it. I, I suppose that's what I mean. They have a stake in finding that history. That actually, it's allowing those institutions to to think about themselves in new ways and because they are so usually very welcoming to these volunteers that those spaces then become spaces that can be queered and and un, and sort of involved with the local community um, and so you know the very fact that they received our play and then put together an art exhibition and some archives alongside that allows a queer audience to come into those spaces perhaps for the first time in their lives and feel like I'm not just looking at say a tractor that I, I sort of recognize in a field but that there are stories suddenly then that you can personally connect with and and the resonances that then you can feel a sense of you are literally creating a sense of belonging in that moment and a, and a rekindling of of something that might have not been fully realized uh, and and often it is yes it, as as is the story for, for so much of queer history it is us going out to have to do the work because the mainstream hasn't given us the time, the money, the resources, and so we have to do that work ourselves. Um, and I think, yeah, that, that sort of the way in which we are beginning to, to queer the, the, the archives that are already there and just to make that more visible, I think that's where I'm, f I'm really excited by this kind of work and the overlap. Um, and in a way that that is going to be then hopefully part of the normalized process so that when your school children are going to these museums and arts and heritage spaces, that they are seeing those queer voices and hearing those queer voices as part of the whole story anyway. And I think that's potentially... Um, sorry, yes, Demetrius, do you want to add something? You can hear me, yes. I've got my, uh, this feeling that I shouldn't speak much because you cannot hear me well, but I wanted to say something here. Um, I, there is... Something that we uh, show to people when we do queer archive, which is the queerness of the present as well. And this for me is very important to put in this discussion as well. I tried to say before that often uh, in talking about the past, we talk about radical difference. So, Tim, you talked about the, the, the pub that uh, had closed down. Or uh, I can think of the gay pride books. Uh, today is completely different than when I first uh, arrived in the city. Um, however, doing the memory work and doing it together creates a radicalness in the present in that it makes queer archive create continuities. 
even when we study radically different. What is the continuity? The continuity is us now performing this present that needs to contain the various pasts. I think that's yeah, that's yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And and the history it's constantly reimagined for the present, you know, who is it for? It's for us now, isn't it? It's it, the people right. so yes. Give give an example now. I mean, we are trying to make so much happen in this kind of different assemblages with people asking um, online, you know, all the problems we have. But there is there an effort to contain so much. And this is the radicalness of this present. There is a certain queerness here, precisely because we want to lay claim to these different histories and we go off the various algorithms, work with them, try to think through the various ways of doing memory work. So there is the queerness of the present here uh, that I, I completely um, uh, want to uh, sort of put to uh, put put as a as a as a point in your project and in so many others that are happening at the moment. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's that's a really interesting thought. Um, yeah, and I think uh, yeah, f I, as we move forward, I think that sense of the, the work that we are doing and and how then that is reintegrated through all of these archival projects is going to be an important part of what we do, and keeping that participation going on. Um, so I think we're going to draw things to a to a close now because we're going to finish for half half four. Um, so you can will the, the uh, screening the live stream will be available online through Torch's uh, website. Um, I would like to say a massive thank you again to everybody, to our actors, to our speakers, uh, Catherine and Demetrius. Thank you so much for giving of your time today. Um, thank you to Fresh Cut for filming the live streaming and a really humongous thank you to Dr. Kira Allman for being my project partner uh, on, this, on this project, which is, yes, I think we're only sort of barely probably halfway through. So uh, do follow us. We have QueerRuralX.com is our website where you can stay uh, uh, up to date with all of the work that we're doing. And uh, the show will be touring next week. We'll be in Suffolk at the Museum of East Anglian Life between the 20th to the 24th. So if you're in East Anglia, do come, do come along uh, and you can book your tickets through the website uh, for the museum. So I'm going to finish uh, the live stream there, but thank you to everyone today for being a part of that. Thank you. <laughs>